Okay, we're kicking off another episode of Mining Now. Today I have Norseman Structures featured on the show. Uh, we're going to get into some, uh, some technical building stuff and the process of putting up these structures, the life of the mine, matching that up with the right building. There's going to be plenty to cover. We even, you're going to get, even see uh, them lifting an F-150 up. So stay tuned for that. We've got a good video to show you. Um, and joining me is Jerry Ma Masangelo. He is the Senior v Vice President of Sales and Marketing and Charmaine Elmgren, uh, the Marketing Manager for Norseman Structures. Welcome both to the show. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Great to be uh, here. Yeah, it's, you know, you, 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 you cover a lot of ground with your buildings. I was on your website today seeing this sort of the, uh, I think the first um, site that comes up on your website is a mine site and you kind of have arrows of where your different buildings are. Um, I guess to kick off the show, I was just wondering, um, you're, you're on mining now. I know you serve multiple industries. So I'm wondering if Charmaine, if you could just give me sort of the, the overview of, of Norseman Structures. Yeah, for sure. So what you saw is correct. We are involved in a lot of industries and Norseman Structures, our space is the pre-engineered building industry. We um, primarily provide fabric covered buildings, but in all kinds of solutions within that pre-engineered building industry. And the industries that we operate in are broad. We do operate in quite a few industries, but our primary focuses are on mining, oil and gas, and commercial agriculture. And mining is really the premier industry that we have worked in the most, um, that and oil and gas over the years. And so that's a prime focus. So we're excited to be here on this podcast today and talk to um, our, all of the guests who are potentially our customers or partners out there who we've worked with for years. When you... Uh... Jerry, I'm gonna I'm just gonna quickly hand this over to you. When you're when you're talking to people now and you know getting feedback from your customers, um, the 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 pre the pre-made or the pre-engineered fabric covered buildings. I mean, is, is it pretty universally known just the quality that that these buildings and structures can come in now, or is there still do you still run into some you know you know, how strong is the fabric, you know, that kind of thing? Or is that sort of an industry standard now that people know just the quality of these structures? Sure. Well, Jared, I think, you know, the first uh, answer is pre-engineered versus kind of a stick built or design built. And I think just from that perspective, there are many customers out there who can see the advantages of a pre-engineered solution. Uh, you know, you're on site, you're not welding on site. Uh, it's puts it, they go together like a mechano set, so it's relatively easy construction, great for remote sites. So just that pre-engineered world, just in general, uh, is I think I think companies are seeing the advantages of those types of buildings. Uh, so now when we talk about our types of pre-engineered structures, uh, the, and that would be a steel frame building with a fabric cladding. Uh, Majority of almost all of our buildings have a fabric clad. Some of them have various percentage of steel, some of it 20, 30 percent of steel cladding, but pretty much every building that we have has a, a portion of fabric cladding. And so from that perspective, then many customers uh, they'll think of these these buildings as tents in some cases. And and when we talk to them and show them the different types of solutions, which we'll talk about here in, in today's discussion. Uh, their eyes widen and, and they, you know, they just don't realize that these, these solutions can be more than just a simple tent. So, uh, so to answer your question, I think there's, it's very, it varies out there. Some people really do understand the advantages and the possibilities uh, with our types of solutions and, and others, it's, it's something new for them. Um, I wanted to, Charmaine, just bring in on the, the part of the focus on the mine. I mean, obviously you're doing, we, we've got other series and you chose to do the mining portion of, of, mining now um, yeah. by Crownsman. And I, I wondered, I, I know it's a primary part of your business, but also just uh, why, why the focus on it and sort of that, sort of the demand within the industry as well. Yeah, for sure. So our primary focus is, has always really been in the industrial sector. And when we look at our company in general, we have been around for a hundred years and mostly in the industrial sector providing various types of shelter throughout the years 
And within this industry, what we find are the key benefits to these types of structures are one, the versatility. They are so versatile in the fact that um, there's so much that you can do with them, but also they can be relocated. They can um, be dismantled with minimal ground disturbance, which is important on a lot of these sites, as well as they can then be moved along with your operations to another place in your location. And we can provide that service to move that building and reconstruct it elsewhere. Um, another one of the benefits to them are that they can be constructed into remote locations and in a fairly timely manner, which is important to get those operations up and running. Um, as Jerry alluded to, these buildings are so diverse in their capabilities. So they have clear span space. So there's no columns you have to maneuver around. You can get really large equipment in there with really tall height clearances in these buildings that allow for uh, large machinery with their boxes up for maintenance right on site, right where it's nice and efficient for getting those pieces of equipment back into operations as quickly as possible and so forth. So those are just a few of the benefits um, for the mining industry in particular. I wanted to, I, I kind of want to stay on the vein of, uh, you mentioned the history of the company in a hundred years. Yeah. Um, I, I could just imagine some of the projects that have gone into those hundred years. Um, if I had a thought about it, I actually would have asked, how, what are some of the oldest photos you have of some of the structures? But um, if, you, you have a slogan that's right behind you, fiercely reliable um, and good on whoever actually went and used the word fiercely because you don't see that in a lot of uh, slogans. So it's very good. And, and can you talk a little bit, even from your own perspective, and, and maybe both of you want some input on this, um, where sort of that fiercely reliable that comes from and how that ties into the history of the company. We want to get into some projects and, and sort of your process of putting up the buildings and everything. But I just kind of wanted to touch on that, um, that slogan tied in with the history. Yeah. Of yeah, I appreciate you asking that. And it, to start with why, you know, why, why are we in this industry? What, why are we passionate about what we do? And why do we do what we do? And when you talk about the tagline, fiercely reliable, and our 100 year history, it really starts from the beginning, right from the beginning, this company has been in the shelter industry. It's always been about shelter of some sort. It started with tents and awnings, moving into rig enclosures for home packaging, all the way to buildings. And so when we look at what we're doing and what we're all about, it's all about protection for our customers, for their assets, their people, and their operations. And so that's our primary focus. And within that, we want to give our customers peace of mind. We want them to walk away knowing that they do have a fiercely reliable solution that is going to be there for them and protect their assets and their operations and their people. And that way they can focus on what they do best in mining, that they can focus on their, their mining operations, knowing that their people are kept safe and are sheltered properly and protected. And so that's where the history of that comes from. And when we talk about fiercely reliable, those words are intentional. You called out the word fiercely. And we are, we're fiercely committed to that. We're going to stand by our products and our solutions. We're going to stand by what that customer's need is and really dive into that and make sure that we're being a reliable partner through and through so that they can have peace of mind and feel protected throughout their whole process. Alrighty, so today we've got Savina Equipment. Savina Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. Visit them at SavinaEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. Next up, we have Railveyor. Railveyor's truly autonomous material haulage systems reduce transport costs up to 91%. And because Railveyor is fully electric, it produces zero direct emissions. The truly autonomous system enhances health and safety by eliminating exhaust fumes and enabling remote monitoring of operations. And Railveyor isn't merely a concept or pilot program. It's available right now and is being proven in a growing number of installations around the globe. Visit their new website at railveyor.com today and step into the future of mining. 
And of course, we also have CIM. The CIM 2022 Convention and Expo is coming back to Vancouver in person this May 1st to 4th. Show off your products and services in mining technology, digitalization, equipment, consulting, and engineering. There are a whole lot of perks waiting for exhibitors and this expo will sell out fast. If you're a researcher thinking about what mining will look like for future generations, this convention is the perfect place to present your technical paper or lead a short course. Visit CIM.org for all the details and book your exhibitor space and submit your abstracts today. We also have Mining for Miracles. This year, Mining for Miracles is eyeing the completion of its commitment to raise $3.385 million to establish the Cellular and Regenerative Medicine Center at BC Children's Hospital. This is to better understand the genetic cause of heart arrhythmias in children. Get involved or make donations at miningformiracles.ca. And last but not least, we've got PowerZone. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to the inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. Jerry, I think this would be a good time to then tie back in the mining industry now, because when you're first in contact with a mine, can you walk us through that process of, of what they are looking for, the questions that they're having, the things that they're trying to figure out, the solutions they're trying to, or, or the, the challenges they're trying to solve? Absolutely. And, and just before I do that, Jared, I'd just like to build a little bit on the, on the reliable uh, part of it, the fiercely reliable thing, is uh, it's, it's extremely important to us for us to be reliable uh, because uh, as we said, we have a hundred year history. Uh, we want another hundred years. And for us to do that, we, we can't really be in a situation where it's work with a customer on one project and, and say goodbye, we'll, we'll see in, a, in the next 50 years. We want to have a, develop a deeper relationship with those customers. So to be reliable in what we're delivering, what we're manufacturing, what we're constructing, is extremely important to us. Uh, and so uh, that then speaks to our, our 100 year uh, history and, and then looking forward. In terms of what, what customers are looking for, uh, what we find is, is our customers, especially uh, in these industrial markets, are looking for solutions. Uh, they're not just looking for a building. Uh, they're not just looking for construction. They're looking for a, a company like Norseman uh, that understands their industry, uh, that understands that's been there before, has done it, and can provide a solution that's going to make sense for them. And that's not always necessarily what the customers asked for. Customer might ask for something, and then when we work with them, we might realize as we're going through these discussions with them that, well, you know, maybe you don't need that type of building. Maybe it's this type of solution over here. So, so really understanding up front what that customer is looking for, and then providing them a solution, uh, a, almost a turnkey solution, if you will that's gonna meet those needs. So many of our customers have those requirements for quality, for safety. Uh, we, we, we not only manufacture our buildings, but we manufacture and then go all the way through construction. And many of our, our uh, customers very much appreciate that type of service, that, uh, that soup to nuts type of service. Do a lot of companies think that they, um, do, do they have a clear picture of, of what they're sort of expecting that they need? Um, and then you sort of have to go through a process of trying to find out where they're actually trying to get to. Is that a pretty common process to have to go through? It's, it's very common. Um, many of our customers will work with larger uh, engineering EPCMs, engineering procurement construction management companies. Um, and so in those cases, they, they, they are pointed in a direction. They say, well, we think we need this. Uh, and, then, and then we can have some discussion with both of those parties, the end customer, the, the mine owner, as well as the EPCM, and, and really try to narrow down what it is the customer is looking for. You know, what is their budget? What's their timeline? What are the requirements of that, uh, of that, that building solution? So it does, it does require some, some exploration with the customer and discussion with them. And, and usually when we can bring some of our experience to the party and, and show them different examples, that's when the customer really starts to think, well, you know what, I was thinking of going in this direction, but now seeing this, maybe we can go in this direction. And so that's uh, what li we'd like to think is uh, what we can bring that value and be that trusted advisor to our current customers and, and then new customers as well. 
I, we're going to dig into it later, but I know because you have these, you have, you're, you're the manufacturer, you're actually doing the construction. In some cases, you're doing the engineering. You're, you really are doing a top to bottom and then the safety side. And we are going to look at it more later. But especially in the mining world where there are so many variables in the location, the type of site, the regulations within even specific regions, that, that must put you, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty shameless plug, but um, it must put you at a real advantage over a company, let's, let's say, just specialized in the insulation or is not the manufacturer or, or what have you. Um, it, how much of an advantage is that um, in, a, in a competitive world like the mining industry? You know, I, I think it's a significant advantage. Uh, we, and we intentionally have gone in this direction of, of not only being the manufacturer, but provide that full solution. And, and we think there's, uh, there's a great advantage there. And I think that the biggest advantage is, is for the customer in that they can not only uh, have, uh, have one company that they can you know, rely on and, and provide that, that solution. So it's, it's, let's say one contract instead of several contracts, uh, less management on that, that customer's behalf, you know, having to manage three or four, you know, serving as the GC and, and managing three or four companies, but also that peace of mind, you know, providing that, Charmaine mentioned it earlier, providing that customer that peace of mind that when I work with Norseman, I know that things are going to get done right. Uh, it doesn't mean we're perfect. Uh, Jared, I'll be the first to, to note that that uh, we've had our share of, of ch challenges on projects, but we're in the construction industry and that's going to happen. Uh, I think what separates us from some of our competitors is that, you know, we're not going to walk away from those issues. If we have a challenge, we're going to, we're going to face it. We're going to fix it. And, and in some cases that makes an eat for an even stronger relationship with our customers. I want to go like I, you sent me some pictures. There's the, you know, there's a bridge crane. There's one, it's quite the, uh, it's like, a, I guess it's like on tracks <laughs> <laughs> building. Um, just talk a little bit going back to that you know is it you know some people is it just a 10 which is obviously not um but just even highlighting some of the capabilities within these structures uh can you just touch on that quickly and then i want to get into some of these uh the segments of your business sure absolutely uh well it's interesting you know when we when we do have lunch and learns with various customers and that includes some some of these epcm companies um Many times uh, eyes widen and, and uh, they're just opened to, you know, lights go on in terms of, wow, I didn't know these buildings could do that. And, and so that is everything from uh, building on rails, for example, uh, building, you know, we need a fabrication facility and, and the building needs to move on rails to accommodate some sort of, let's say it's a fabrication uh, requirement. Uh, so there's that, there's, uh, bu these buildings can support uh, uh, bridge cranes. And so uh, we have uh, some buildings, many buildings, we've sold over 40 buildings to one customer that they all have a 15 ton bridge crane attached to the building, uh, the 20 ton bridge cranes, uh, hanging conveyors from our building. So, so there's, you know, many times when we, we talk about these things and the, the, the different opportunities uh, that could be available to, to customers with these, these types of buildings, these steel frame buildings with a fabric cover, uh, their eyes are very much open to, to that type of solution. And that's all in addition to what Charmaine was mentioning before in terms of, well, they, you can be relocated. You know, if the mine life is 10 years or 15 years, we have a solution where, where now that building can, you know, minimal ground disturbance and, and can be relocated. And if that's required, if a simple solution is required, then absolutely great. We can offer that fit for purpose solution to that customer. If one of these more exotic or elaborate solutions are required where we have bridge cranes and conveyors and all these kinds of things, then, then yeah, we can do that as well. And, and in large part, because we have in-house engineering group, uh, that is another way that we can differentiate ourselves and do differentiate ourselves from our competition. And we can take on those, those more uh, meaty projects, if you will. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, and I, you know, I understand some of these projects are under NDAs and things like that. So we can't necessarily bring up the building and say, Hey, this is where it is and that, but but I want to talk, Charmaine, about just I want to go into those divisions because um, these the process and the capabilities are so much underpinned by how the company itself is structured. So can you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. When we talk about 
a shelter solution, which is what we call our, our product, starting with that shelter, um, we talk about it as a being a lot more than a building. It, um, it's really about the process and the services and experience that come all in combination um, with what we're delivering, as Jerry mentioned, about this fully integrated approach. And so it's just as important that we get every step of that process right as the building itself and the product itself. And so it really starts in that design phase right at the beginning with our sales and proposals team as we talk with the customer and understand and uncover what that need is. Jerry alluded to that already a little bit. So we go really in depth with um, the customer to understand that we start from the inside out. What is going on inside the building that is needing to be protected or is going to enhance operations? And that helps us to determine what the solution might be for the customer that's going to optimize their project. And then we bring in our design um, drafting team as well as our engineering team. And so then they start to look at it and take the environment into consideration, what they want to do with this building, the accessories, whether that's bridge crane or uh, the foundation, flooring, everything else that needs to be taken into consideration. They take a look at that. And then we, once a project is is sold and we are started to work all the way through with that. We have a project manager assigned who walks directly with that customer all the way through the process to completion. And so while we're in the engineering and design phase through to manufacturing, we work directly with the customer with that project manager and then straight into construction. We also have an internal quality and safety team that is looking at all of the requirements for the mine sites and those companies involved of what is required there. So it's this really, it's this whole process that brings it all together to make the project successful. And then once we're on site, our crews out there are set up for success because of everything that we've gone through from the beginning. So in the end, we're coming up with a solution that the customer is going to, that's going to meet all the customer's needs in the end. We don't want to um, just kind of take the original request and, and just put it into production. We have to go through that process. And so we have a model that walks us through that from collaborative design, fit for purpose engineering um, to quality and manufacturing and construction. And then we try to provide an empathetic service throughout that whole process. We know that sometimes it's not easy and sometimes we need to make sure that we're understanding all of those needs. So we try to bring empathy throughout that whole process to make sure that the customer is really taken care of. Um, how long, just, just curious, like a, like a major project, you know, a, a very customized type thing. What, well, from the start to finish, we, we, we'd be talking months. Um, what, what would be a, what would you expect when it's like this a major project, a major operation? And I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, quality and safety and those types of things that come into play. What, what would a, what would a project take before it's, you know, this is an operational uh, building? Sure. Yeah, I, I can grab that one, uh, Sharon. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're looking at there is, is it's not weeks. It's more likely months. Uh, Jared, to answer your question for these these more custom structures, and and I guess then it depends on what is our scope of work. You know, is there is it uh, uh, a bunch of concrete? Is it concrete retaining walls, eight foot high, sixteen foot high? What's included in the other scope of work at, for this this project? Uh, in some cases, there's long lead items. Uh, you know, especially with supply chain the way it is today. Right, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes overhead doors can can be a long lead item in supply chain. Uh, but depending on 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 uh, the, that scope of work, we're very likely looking at months. And so that's uh, design. We're talking about getting through that process, getting through the contracting, design, fabrication, uh, ship it to site, install it, and 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 then take care of all of the other accessories on site. So um, having said that, there are projects, uh, multi multi uh, building projects that that extend over years with certain customers. Uh, but typically what we're looking at for these custom projects are months. Now, having said that, just to go to the simple projects, if, if a customer requires a simple solution, 
one of the advantages of what, what we can offer is, is relatively quick turnaround. So because we have that in-house engineering and design and it's a, more of a standard building, okay. uh, we can typically put that through our fabrication facility quickly, install it quickly. And so, you know, in some cases, a very simple solution, We've seen uh, from start to finish buildings go up in weeks. And by that, I mean, let's say six to eight weeks yeah. from start to finish. Uh, but again, those are more simple solutions and those more custom solutions that, that have all the, the, the accessories and scope of work, as I described earlier, that's typically months. So would that be, would it be quite a mix like Norseman structures or would they be providing a, a, a quite a mixture of both? Yeah, we would we would provide a mix, uh, even though some of our customers look at us and say, oh, that looks complicated. We need to engage with Norseman on that. Uh, that's fantastic. But many of those customers also have simple solution needs. They, you know, they don't need always need the, the, the big Taj Mahal. They they just need a simple warehouse. And so there's there is a mix. Uh, we we want to work with those customers that that have that need, you know, everything from simple to to more complex and, and that allows us to not only flex our muscle uh, from an engineering and design perspective, but it also allows us to deepen that relationship with the customer and provide them the kinds of solutions that they're looking for. Yeah, and oh, oh sorry, Jared, I just might add one little thing to that. Um, when I was talking about the process earlier, sometimes our projects use just one of those components of that process and sometimes it's the whole wheel so sometimes it's just it's more focused on the construction side of it um, because we're going in and doing a relocation of a building or sometimes it's on the manufacturing end and we're just a supplier in that situation um typically in mining we end up being the full solution provider but not necessarily that a customer goes through that entire process so it's really customizable towards what the customer's needs are oh actually i want to clarify something else so when you yeah. talk about you know like some of these floors are going to be cement well a lot of them would be cement floors and or like the 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 blocks, you know, you'll talk about a double stack block or things like that. Um, is that also part of what you're providing? Are you actually coming in to like laying the cement or in the foundations, or would that be a separate contract? I just well, just a technical question. Sure, we'll we'll uh, we'll do the design of of those foundations. We'll we'll take care of you know just to backtrack a little bit. We'll to take care of the foundations, the flooring, the building, mechanical, electrical, you know, the heating, ventilation, oh, okay. all of that. Um, so we can do that. Now, in some cases, we, it makes sense for us to work with a partner. You know, a, a company's already mobilized a site uh, and they can take care of the concrete. And so we, we have, we work with a lot of companies in that regard where we, we partner with companies. And so then it, at that, if that's the situation, then it's the customer will decide, well, do I want to have one contract with Norseman and then they take care of everything and have subs under, subcontractors underneath them? Or do they want to work with uh, directly with some of these other companies? And and we're very happy working in, in any of those solutions. So to answer your question, if, uh, if customer needs, needs a concrete slab uh, for a floor or if they need maybe a temporary floor, uh, we, can, we can provide that for that customer. Now getting into the safety side of it. I mean, mining, I, I think every second show has a major safety element that we do here, probably almost every show actually. Um, can you talk about it from your perspective? Uh, not just not just your own standards, but working within the standards of especially some of these mining. And I know mining is sort of, you know, the, even the oil sands, that's, that's also considered mining. It's just sort of these, these standards that are, that are within these sites, within these provinces, regions, all of that, and then within your own standards as well. Can you just sort of walk us through that part of it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess what I would say, you know, first off the top here, Jared, is that from our perspective, uh, you know, so many times we'll talk with customers and when they speak about safety, they're really referring to on-site safety, construction safety. And that's extremely important to us. Uh, what's also though very important to us is, is safety in the design. So when we're designing this building, we wanna make sure that we're designing a building that's safe. And so uh, as, you, as you know, uh, things collapse. Uh, bridges collapse, buildings collapse. In our industry, there have been situations where these types of buildings have collapsed. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, Norseman structures have never had a, an engineered building fail or collapse. 
Uh, and I think that speaks to, you know, the quality and that, that hundred year uh, history that I was talking about and being first and reliable. And so for us, safety starts in the design room. We want to make sure that we're designing a building that's safe. And then when we get to site, then obviously then safety is a big issue. And so we have uh, a department, uh, HSEQ department, that's, that's focused uh, solely on, on safety. Uh, we have our own standards. And typically when we've talked about customer standards, when, when customers provide us their standard uh, standards for, for whether it's health, safety, environment quality, we will uh, typically meet or exceed what those customers are providing or asking us to, to do. And we work with all of the, you know, think of any major uh, mining company, whether that's in the oil sands or hard rock mining. And, uh, and so we work with pretty much any of those and all of those companies. And so uh, it's, it's almost second nature to us to, to ensure that, that uh, HSEQ is, is top of our mind. What uh, I got, I got to bring up the F one fifty video because that was just a, <laughs> that was just a neat project. And um, can we? Uh, so so uh, I guess first off, who came up with that idea <laughs> to lift a truck <laughs> with your fabric? Well, I think uh, I think the the question there is maybe why? Why did we do why? that? Yeah. And and so many times people will refer to this uh, fabric, and when we're doing lunch and learns and such, and you know, people, they can wrap their heads around the, the frame, but this fabric, you know, what's this canvas? You know, they might refer to it as canvas or this tarp or, or how strong is this? Is it going to last? And so uh, one of the reasons for that video was to demonstrate to, to customers that, that this isn't just a simple canvas, you know, like a canvas tent that's going to rip. Uh, it's not that type of, uh, of material. So it's very durable. And that's, that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we did that. So I'm sure, I mean, I'm not sure if you wanted to add any to that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you've said. We actually have um, these fabric tear sheets where we put a cut in them and we allow people to use their own human grip strength to see if they can tear it even further and tear it apart. And no one can do that. There, that can't be done with human strength. And so it's just, it's a fun way to play off of it and show people um, the strength and really show that these are, these truly are strong buildings and that they are built to last. They are um, they're going to be reliable, that's for sure. And they are engineered, these buildings are engineered for those high wind and snow loads um, in Canada. And so it's, um, yeah, they have the strength and this is just one fun way to show it. Is the, is the, uh, you mentioned the snow loads, is the fabric itself, is it, a, uh, is it primarily a frame that when, when you're uh, basically countering a high snow load in places like Northern Canada, or is it, is it fabric or is it both? Uh, it's, it's mainly the fabric. And so, uh, what, what needs to be considered is when we're in a high snow load area is that when, uh, there may be situations where that the snow is going to, uh, stay on the building. Now, in many cases, the snow sheds off the building. Yeah. Um, we don't make the assumption that all the snow is going to shed off the building. So we design our buildings to, to the building code. And so we have to then account that some of that snow is going to uh, stay on the building. And so when that snow does stay on the building, that fabric, it has some deflection to it. And so that fabric is gonna deflect. And so what we then need to do is, is consider not only the strength of the fabric, but if that, if that fabric uh, deflects or sags uh, too much, it then might be touching on the frame, you know, the, the pearl ends or the, or the other uh, bracing in that building. And so we have to consider those issues. And so we've designed our, having said that, we've designed these buildings for extremely high snow load areas. So places in Newfoundland, places in British Columbia, uh, some places in, in Chile and in the mountains, for example, can have extremely high snow loads. And we design our buildings for that. And, and again, I just want to reiterate, we're not assuming that all the snow is going to shut off the building. Uh, that, that is done by some of our competitors. We don't do that. And so that means then we may have to have a tighter truss spacing. So you talked about the frame, Jared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many times, let's say our, our frames are going to be 20 feet between frames. In a really high snow load area, that 20 feet might be reduced to 15 or 10 or whatever that may be uh, to account for this higher snow load and this deflection or sagging of that fabric. 
Um, at the beginning, you also mentioned that there is cases where steel cladding um, will come into play. What, what would be an example of, of why that would be required in, in a, even a, in a portion of the building? Sure, sure. So in, in some cases, a customer will need, let's say, a fire rated wall. You know, one of the walls or maybe two of the walls need to have a fire rating, one hour, two hour fire rating. If that's the case, then, then there's really no fabric that's going to provide that kind of solution. And so in those cases, we'll provide that, that uh, steel cladding on one wall or two walls and, and make it so that that is, is uh, going to be a fire rating wall. In other cases, it may be it's not a fire rating. It might just be a customer preference. They, they want to have steel cladding on, on uh, various sides or maybe all sides of the building. And so... You know, I'm glad you brought that up, Jared, and that we, we realize that the, these types of solutions, steel frame with a fabric uh, uh, clad, is not always going to be the solution for every customer. And uh, we'd like to think that we can be agnostic in that, that way and provide that customer a solution that's going to make sense for them. Charmaine, can, uh, I want to touch on the, the fire retardant side of it, though, um, out of the fabric itself. Can you, can mm -hmm. you go through that? Yeah, so our fabric comes in a standard option or a fire retardant option, and that's usually what's required on these sites is this fire retardant fabric. And so how this works is that if a flame were to hit the fabric, it actually just melts the fabric away. So it doesn't actually start to add fuel to the flame and spread the flame. And what happens is a whole comes into the fabric, it melts away and there's a hole and then the flame and the smoke can actually escape out of the building. So it's actually a really great feature of a fabric covered building. If there were to be an unfortunate fire in your facility, these buildings actually have a lot less damage than a lot of other traditional structures because of the way that the fabric just melts away and allows that to escape. So what ends up happening is sometimes a portion or maybe all of the fabric needs to be replaced on that building. Um, but it's often that you don't lose the whole building in its entirety as a result. I guess that would lead to the question if, a, you know, like in this video, if the whole, you know, a foot in diameter got, I mean, is this a repairable section? Do you have to replace a whole section? Is there patching? Like, yeah. How does that work? Absolutely. Yeah, it can be depending on what happens to the structure. If something were to somehow get punctured or if there is a, a small hole from a flame or something like that that was extinguished quickly, that can be repaired either by a patch if it's small enough or just one section of the fabric um, within that building can be replaced. So sometimes that's a bay from truss to truss, depending on how the the fabric has been um, installed on that building, or maybe it is the whole cover or just an end wall of fabric, depending on where the damage is. So it does add a lot of versatility for repair with the fabric. Um, what are some of the other reasons people um, are going, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different elements when you're coming in to decide what kind of building and structure to put up. Mm -hmm. um, can you, Charmaine, can you do a touch on a few that maybe we haven't covered already? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the biggest benefits and the one that's probably talked about the most is natural light. These covers are translucent. Um, they can be purchased with a blackout material so that light doesn't come in, but they are translucent for the most part. And so that means that natural light is flooding into your space, which reduces potential need for electricity. If it's just a warehouse that you're accessing during daytime hours, you might not even need to add electrical to the facility because of the daylight that is flowing through the space. Or it just adds to the environment, making it a more comfortable environment, a brighter environment, a more airy space, as well as it's actually safer in a lot of ways. Instead of having pockets, dark pockets within a workshop, um, you now have light throughout the whole place during daytime hours. So that's one of the main benefits of these facilities of why you would go with fabric, um, the fire retardancy, as well as then corrosion. Um, when you think about if you have 
metal cladding or um, different kinds of structures that is susceptible to corrosion and fabric is not. And so while we do have a lot of corrosion protection options on the steel, one thing that we don't have to worry about is the cladding on the building and in the mining sector, whether it's the outside exterior environment that might have corrosive properties or the interior environment that has corrosive properties if we're based off of what we're storing in there, sometimes it's highly corrosive. And so if that's the case, then this is another great option that comes along with that um, in the cladding. Um, Jerry, I'm sure you get asked about warranty a few times uh, in a year. So uh, uh, I've got, I wanna get into the next section that I wanna talk about is sort of that, the planning side, the questions that people need to be asking themselves and you while, they're, while you're, you're actually planning out the buildings. Um, but before that, I think we should just quickly let the audience know sort of what, what would a warranty look like on one of these, uh, typically one of these units. Sure, absolutely. And I think this ties back to our, to our conversation around lifting up the F-150 truck uh, to demonstrate to customers that, you know, this isn't a simple canvas, it's a strong, it's a strong uh, material. And so with that, then you're right, we get many questions as to uh, what, what is the warranty for this? And, and so we can offer a 20 year warranty on our, on our uh, fire return fabric. And so typically that is, is, is very acceptable to customers, especially in the mining industry. Uh, if we're looking at a mine life of 10, 15 or 20 years, that's typically not a problem. Um, and I, I will go back a little bit to, to uh, what makes up that warranty. It's more than just saying, here's, here's a 20 year warranty. Um, in some cases, in many cases, the design, how that fabric is attached to the building uh, will be an indicate in terms of how long that fabric is gonna last. Like for example, if that fabric is not tensioned very tight to the building, it can flap around, move around. And when that happens, there's wear and tear on that fabric. So our design, the design that we impose in terms of how we're going to strap that fabric down and tighten it down is, is, is very important in, in terms of us providing that kind of warranty. And it's also important in terms of maintenance for that building, because uh, with, these, with these buildings, once, uh, once they're installed and they, they go through a, a summer, uh, regular maintenance is, is very minimal. So, uh, you know, as long as you don't as we said before, drive a forklift through the fabric or something along those lines, uh, there's very little maintenance on these, on required on these uh, buildings. So that speaks to the design. Uh, but to answer your question, the fabric, we can warrant that fabric to 20 years. And in, in places like, you know, the, you know, these harsh climates like Nunavut and Kitimat, and, you know, these where really it's sort of uh, harsh plus plus <laughs> in some of these places, um, it, it, can, these, can these buildings last 20 years? Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, that's where a lot of our business is done is uh, is northern Canada. And uh, and so, yes, short answer is yes. We've seen, although we'll warrant these buildings for 20 years, uh, we've seen these buildings last 25, 30 years. And when I say buildings, I mean the fabric. Uh, now, when it does get to that age, that 20 year uh, mark, there, there should be some, you know, annual kind of look at that fabric and just see where it's at. Does it need to be replaced or repaired? Uh, but long, long story short is, is yes, these, we've seen buildings last uh, beyond the 20 year mort. Um, Jerry, we've, we've talked about the, the fabric uh, itself and, and in different applications, different environments, but what about the steel frames, the, the steel frame itself, the different types of steel, the different frame structures um, based on the different environments or even the different um, products within the building itself? Yeah, absolutely, Jared. Uh, you know, that is an important part, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is that uh, in, in some ways, some of our customers come to us for these more complicated projects. And so, you know, one example is uh, we're doing a, a truck shop uh, in, in the Fort McMurray area. Uh, it's uh, the peak height of that building is 135 feet tall. Wow. And so that is a very, very tall, large structure. And so just the the engineering and the design and the, the, the uh, construction required to execute a project like that definitely goes up an extra level. Uh, another example would be when we're, let's say we have a commodity storage uh, solution uh, requirement 
and it's a, a corrosive environment. So in those cases, uh, as I mentioned before, we can, if we need to hang the conveyor from the building, we can. In this particular example I'm thinking of, we, we, we have the conveyor uh, hung from our building. Uh, in this case, because it is a corrosive uh, environment inside the building, uh, the epoxy, the steel is epoxy painted. So typically our steel is, is galvanized, uh, but if we're in a very extremely corrosive environment, uh, not only is the fabric a great solution, as, as Charmaine indicated earlier, it's inert, so it's not going to be impacted by the corrosive nature. But if we really have a corrosive environment, then we can epoxy paint that steel, uh, which is going to add another layer of protection for the steel frame. And so in those cases, then we can uh, I'll offer a warranty not only for the fabric, which we've talked about before, but also a warranty for the steel in that very corrosive environment. As we're getting towards the end, I just kind of wanted to have an understanding, and I, I think the audience, if there, if if somebody's you know going to go onto your contact page and reach out or connect with you on LinkedIn, um, what should some of the questions they be asking? That the, what are some of the things they need to understand? You know, as far as where they're located, you know, the size of the buildings, all that sort of. What's some basic information that that would be helpful to sort of get that process going and have an understanding of? Well, I think that it, we kind of touched on this a little bit uh, already, Jared. It's it's really understanding, you know, your operation and understanding uh, maybe what you want, and then maybe digging a little deeper and figuring out what that customer really needs. And so really getting an idea of, of what's going to happen inside of that building. Um, and, and is it a maintenance shop? Uh, is it, are, is there, are there trucks involved, diesel trucks? What kind of ventilation is required? So all of these types of questions will, as we indicated earlier, we try to cover off with that customer so that there's a, a real good understanding as to what that, that customer may want and may need. Now, you know, in some cases, the, the customer, as I said before, they're working with a, uh, an engineering procurement and construction company, and, and those companies will help that customer to kind of get to that realization. And if that's the case, fantastic. But, but uh, we'll, we'll typically want to really understand, as, as Charmaine said, you know, what's going on inside this building. And then we can then hopefully be that trusted advisor to that customer and, and uh, ask the right questions then, and allow us then to come to the uh, come to the solution that's going to make sense for them. What about those windows of deliveries in um, you know places again like an Innovet or you know some of these ice roads and that? Is there do you, do you have a competitive advantage over something like uh, like a steel building? I, I would assume there would be just sort of given the the way that they're constructed. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we do have an advantage there. And so in addition to those other advantages we talked about in terms of being relocated or translucent uh, fabric or whatever, uh, timeliness is definitely definitely an issue. And so for us to to uh, hit an ice road, you know, to deliver a building over an ice road or, or meet a barge date, uh, we we do that to very regular occasions. So that's that's extremely important. Now, I guess what I would say is that uh, every year, without fail. Uh, we'll have customers come to us in September and uh, tell us that, uh, geez, I, I think it's gonna snow soon. I need a building next week or next month. And, and that's not, not gonna happen. Like we, we, we can't uh, be miracle workers in that regard. Uh, so that my point here is, is that planning ahead and, and a little bit of planning ahead, whether we need to meet a barge or not, uh, just, and so that we're really you know, on track and in sync with that customer in terms of what their needs are, we can really devote some time to that and then have that time to, to design and fabricate, uh, ship that building and then do the construction before the snow flies is, uh, is extremely important. Yeah, and on that, I think this year is also a bit of a unique year um, because there are supply issues, there are shipping issues in the world today. And so if there is someone out there who's looking for ice roads for this season and trying to plan that, now's the time to really start. Um, it's really good to get that in the queue now um, because if, yeah, as Jerry mentioned, if you're waiting until fall um, on any year, it's going to be starting to be tight timelines in order to meet that. And so starting early is definitely um, helpful, especially in today's times. Um, we covered quite a bit of ground. I, I wanna swing the, 
swing the focus back around to sort of the, the internal part of, of the company. Um, again, going back to that slogan that's right behind you, Charmaine, fiercely reliable. And I want I, to wrap up the interview, I think I'd like both of you to answer this question is that focus, how does that on a daily basis, how are you approaching it as a team? What, what are some of the discussions? How does sort of get everybody? I mean, you've got, you know, you have five different divisions. You've got engineers and people putting up buildings, people looking at the safety measures. How do you sort of coordinate that with under an, the umbrella of one company with one focus? Um, maybe Charmaine, start with you and then Jerry, hand it over to you. Yeah, for sure. So our culture is super important to us here and our what our purpose is and our values. And that's intertwined into everything we do. And we put actually a lot of focus behind that within this company of really making sure that everyone is on board with that. And we've really focused a lot actually in the last while on the customer experience and really standardizing what we want that customer experience to be like every time so that we can be consistent, which is the key to being fiercely reliable. We want to be consistent every time we work with a customer. And so we have standards and frameworks for every department that are based off of a full company standard and then frameworks departmentally on how we can accomplish those standards. So everyone is on the same page collectively. And we talk about our values. We talk about these standards every day in every meeting. And that really keeps us aligned and focused um, from every aspect. What are we focusing on? It's why we call it a shelter solution. Going back to the start of the conversation, we call it that to remind ourselves of what are we sheltering? What are we protecting? Let's keep our focus there and let's make sure that we are thinking like a customer, which is one of our values, and every step of that process. So that's really the key is that it's ingrained into everything we do from our conversations to our processes and procedures to the actual design of the products that we have and the services that we offer. That's a very good answer, Charmaine. So uh, Jerry, you've got a big uh, task to, uh, to add on to that, but I, I will, I'll let you answer you. And if it's from a personal perspective, how you sort of keep those values in line um, in your own work? Well, you know, Jared, I, I guess what I would say is you're right. Uh, that's a fantastic uh, response there, Charmaine. <laughs> and I guess what I would say uh, to that is that the thing I appreciate about Norseman is that, uh, is that we're not satisfied with just saying that, you know what, yeah, we're pretty good. Uh, as Charmaine indicated that, uh, you know, recently we've, we've dug into this customer experience uh, uh, project and and really understanding yes one of our values is think like a customer uh, but but we look at that and we say you know what we have room for improvement we can do better and so the mm -hmm. fact that we'll take a look at that as a, as a company and within the company the different departments and such we'll take a look at that and say okay how can we improve that customer experience for the external customer for the internal customer and and that that kind of perspective to to say you know what uh, we're never going to be perfect. Let's strive for excellence every day. And, and that's just one example that speaks to this issue of being fiercely reliable. Um, so I, I think that's, that's an important mm -hmm. note that, uh, you know, we, we, we were, we're not resting on our laurels. We're not uh, thinking that uh, we're the best things in sliced bread. Uh, I think we're pretty gosh darn good, uh, but there's, there is room for improvement. And so from my perspective, uh, I very much appreciate that about the company. And, and on a personal note, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's important to me to, to do that and lead by example uh, with, with our organization. And so uh, that doesn't mean I'm always perfect, but, but it's extremely important that as, as leaders in the company, uh, that, that we, we take that role and, and we, we try to do our best and strive for excellence every day. And so on a personal note, uh, fiercely reliable, that slogan, uh, shelter solution more than a building, you know, all of these things that we have in, in our company and our values uh, very much resonate with me. And, and, and I do make that personal. I don't think I, I, I've, and I've learned over the years, and I, I think I'm still learning it is, is customers do not expect you to be perfect. They respect, mm -hmm. they expect you to take on full responsibility for what they need from you. 
that that's what they want. They want full responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering too, when you look at you, you both mentioned that sort of that standardizing the customer experience. When you were looking at that, did you find consistent gaps? Was it about standardizing, or did you go, oh, this at this point in the process, there's this snag that happens quite consistently? Did you did you find things like that? Yeah, what we did is we actually had every department in the company work through um, a process of identifying every customer touch point that they have and every touch point that they work within that will influence the customer at some point, even if they never work with a customer face to face. Um, what are they doing in their daily job that is impacting the customer and then evaluating that on based off of where do we think we stand on that today? Where can we improve? Where are we doing really well? And where, where do we need to work on? And so another part of that is then bringing the customer's voice into it. And so that's something that we're going to be evaluating on an ongoing basis and measuring back to those standards. We had to get those standards and that framework in place first and understand where we're at and then we can bring that customer's voice into it and really make sure that we're evaluating that process all along at all of those touch points to make sure that we're consistent at every stage so a big part of it was engaging our entire team from the welders in our manufacturing shops straight through to those who are face to face and front line with our customers. We needed everybody involved in that process. So, so that's how we've gone about identifying that. And certainly we know that there's areas that we've already spent a lot of time working on and then areas where we still have room to grow. And so that comes into all of our goals and strategic initiatives as a company. And that's how we stay focused on the customer and always improving and becoming as fiercely reliable as we possibly can. I, I think I'm pretty sure we could do an episode just on that entire <laughs> process. I can imagine the work that went into doing that. It's uh, and, and good luck to your competitors. <laughs> <with that. laughs> yes. Um Thank you both for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate it and, and working with us to sort of put it all this together. Um, you know, people see the end, end show, um, but they don't see all the work that a lot of companies like yourself are actually putting in to help us put it on the show. So we really do appreciate it and, and hope you come back on again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, I've just really enjoyed talking with you today, Jared. Thank you, Charmaine. Yes. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate that. Thank you, Jared. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for watching. Please keep suggesting guests um, and helping us to put on the show. It, there is, there's so much in the industry to cover, and we haven't even scratched the surface. So, um, again, thank you to the Norseman Structure for, for being on the show. Structures, wow. Um, Norseman Structures for being on the show. Uh, we'll have plenty of links to their website and LinkedIn pages, and you can connect directly with the guests from the show. And thank you to our sponsors and our entire team for helping put on the production. We will see you on the next episode of Mining.